Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's ahead this week on One Detroit. Making sense out of the proposed maps for new legislative and congressional districts with MLive's Lauren Gibbons. Then PFAS contamination found in places you may not expect. New regulations announced out of Washington this week. And then Detroit chef Phil Jones finds a solution to one of the many food instability problems created by the pandemic. It's all ahead this week on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Esselford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by, and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald, so happy to have you with me this week. Public meetings to comment on the new redistricting maps begin this week around the state. We will sort it out with MLive's Lauren Gibbons, who has been covering this process extensively. Plus news out of Washington, the EPA announces new goals to regulate the man-made chemicals called PFAS. We have a Great Lakes Now special report on PFAS contamination and the places you may not expect it to be. Then Detroit chef Phil Jones talks about banding together with other chefs to feed people in need throughout the COVID pandemic. It is all coming up this week on One Detroit. It's been a process, but the Independent Redistricting Commission recently released its first drafts of the new legislative and congressional districts here in the state. And starting this week, the public gets to give their opinions on the new maps. Remember, this all started back in 2018 when voters wanted to take the politics out of drawing maps. This is a complicated process. So I turned to MLive political reporter Lauren Gibbons, who has extensively covered this. She breaks it down into the seven things we need to know. These maps are supposed to come into play for the 2022 election and then hold for the next 10 years. I love how you wrote uh, your most recent article in MLive that kind of gave us the seven things now to look forward to as we go into this next process with, with the redistricting maps. The first thing, the maps as drawn would shake up the status quo, and we're looking at 10 options for statewide maps, four options for congressional districts, and three for the state and the, uh, and the House. Yes, and uh, also uh, commissioners had the option to submit individual maps as well. So some of those are floating out there. I think the 10 collaborative maps are really indicative of what the commission has been thinking and working on in these, uh, in these meetings that they've been doing almost every business day um, for the last couple of weeks here. Some of the scores in terms of whether the which party would benefit, some of those scores still lean Republican, although uh, the trends so far uh, show it looking a lot more competitive. I think another area uh, that your viewers would probably be really interested in is the Detroit area. Um, the way that the commissioners drew the maps is significantly different, uh, especially in the state legislative different districts. A lot of pieces of Detroit would be linked to uh, communities outside of the city in their political districts. But all over the state, there are instances where you'd be seeing incumbents pitted against each other, where people are um, you know, facing the prospect of either having to move or maybe run from a different district because uh, congressional candidates can do that if they choose. And those changes could still happen because your second point is, but they could look a lot different by the time that they are passed. Yes, absolutely. So if the commission wants to, um, they put these drafts out. They're not beholden to work from these maps. Uh, they could scrap it entirely. They could start from scratch. Uh, they are bumping up against a deadline here. They are hoping to pass out their maps by November 5th so the public can have another comment period before they, uh, before they vote on the final maps in late December. 
And the third point you made was meeting required mapping criteria is complicated. And this is these are criteria laid out in the state constitution that they have to follow. Some of the more obvious ones include making sure that they're about the same number of population. Uh, the Voting Rights Act, as I previously mentioned, is a federal requirement. But at the state level, they also are beholden to a number of other criteria. And they're in ranked order. Some of those include communities of interest, which uh, are, are areas or groups of people that identify with each other that perhaps have similar views or similar jobs or similar life experiences, even in some cases. Um, another one is obviously partisan fairness, and that is making sure that the districts are fair. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the things that a lot of people who supported a different redistricting process made sure that it was fair to both parties. And, and what fair constitutes as well. As, as well. Right. Um, you, the next thing, and you have brought this up, with, is um, a crucial factor of the Voting, uh, the Voting Rights Act compliance um, and, and looking at minority representation in the districts. We've heard from current and former Detroit lawmakers, a lot of Detroit community members uh, express a lot of concerns with the way that the commission has interpreted the Voting Rights Act based on input from their experts that they hired to consult on these maps. And the big distinction is that currently uh, we have um, we have several uh, majority Black districts um, at the state House, Senate, and congressional level. And under these maps, uh, there would not be any majority Black districts. There are a few districts that have a plurality of Black voting age population, but uh, there's no outright majority of 50% or more. Um, high stakes public hearings up next. They're starting this week, and they're going to be happening around the state. Yes, so the first one is in Detroit on Wednesday, and they're also going to be hitting Grand Rapids, Lansing, Gaylord, and Flint before uh, October 26th is the last hearing. So uh, there's several different opportunities to comment. You can look at the maps online. You can make informed public comments about how you feel about them. Um, and each commenter has 90 seconds uh, to address the board. And the next thing is the current timeline and why commissioners are blowing their deadline. There are a number of factors, uh, but the main factor in this case is the delay of U.S. census data. Usually the census data comes out in the springtime, and so co the commission under you know, a perfect world would have had several months to uh, observe that data and uh, play with the different ways that they could draw the maps. Um, instead, it came in mid-August is when the commissioners finally had a chance to look at that data in depth. And uh, so they had an updated timeline based on that. Um, November 1st is the constitutional deadline, as I already said, uh, they are not even voting on, um, they're not even taking their next voting right. steps until November 5th. So um, the idea uh, that they put forward is to have these through by December 30th. And that is really the, that's the last point that legal challenges are likely um, and also probably stemming from um, all the different criteria that there is a number of different ways that people could challenge what they end up with here. Yes, and I think the, the main point here is that, uh, as you said, uh, there are a lot of different interpretations of what FAIR means, uh, mm -hmm. what the ideal maps look like, and uh, I would imagine, especially because this is a new process, uh, there may even be more legal challenges than usual. Um, I think the big ones we'll start to see after, you know, after November 1st and after the commission uh, approves its maps for the 45-day public comment period starting, um, starting after they vote. This week, the Biden administration announced new strategy to combat man-made chemicals called PFAS. The EPA plans to enact a national drinking water standard and accelerated cleanup. PFAS are a large group of man-made chemicals that don't break down and can build up in our bodies. But you don't have to drink PFAS to be exposed to it. One Detroit and Great Lakes now teamed up with Type Investigations and journalist Tom Perkins for this next story. While writing about PFAS for The Guardian and Huff Post, Tom learned a lot about what PFAS has been used for and got personally concerned looking at the things in his house. 
the more I reported on the issue and the more I learned what products they're in, I started to look around my apartment and go, my God, there are dozens of things in here that are sometimes made with the chemicals. Am I getting a slow drip of poison from, from these things? And there's my cat, Ling Ling, or in Hamtramck, and the problem is PFAS, a family of chemicals known for their water and stain repellent qualities that are used in everything from waterproof shoes to clothing to bike chain lube, even food packaging. I wanted to know how much PFAS Ling Ling and I are getting into our bodies and our daily lives, so I made a plan. What we're gonna do is test a bunch of different products around my house that are sometimes made with the chemicals and see if they have PFAS in them. One of the main ways people ingest the chemicals is through their water. And we're gonna test the uh, tap water as well and, and then get my blood checked out. And Ling Ling's getting her blood checked too. Industry has just introduced chemical after chemical and they don't provide that information to the public. So mm -hmm. it's impossible for scientists to keep up with what's actually being used. Yeah. And Erica Schrader is the science director of the Seattle-based advocacy group, Toxic Free Future. You know, some unexpected chemicals have been found in people recently. There was a compound that was found in the river water in North Carolina. And then after that, they tested residents and found it in 98% of the residents. So it was a previously unheard of chemical that almost everybody in that area was being exposed to. The wide application of these chemicals means that you can't pinpoint the particular use that's led to your exposure very easily. Carla Ng is a PFAS researcher at the University of Pittsburgh who models the chemicals bioaccumulation in humans and wildlife. There are thousands of potential products that use these chemicals and therefore you may be exposed via your food, via your sports equipment, via your carpets, mm -hmm. um, through your electronic equipment. And so pinpointing the one particular chemical that's in your blood, knowing exactly where that came from becomes that much more difficult. I shipped a couple dozen household items to a lab at the University of Notre Dame. There's advanced PFAS research going on there, led by Professor Graham Peasley. Food packaging is a big one. Nonstick Reynolds wrap, parchment paper, different food wrappers from restaurants around Detroit. That's one of the, the main routes of exposure. You know, I want to remind you that a lot of our concern about the use on food packaging is what happens before it comes to the consumer and after it comes to the consumer because yeah. we see quite a bit of, of pollution in the production phase. And then after you dispose of it, you know, depending on where you live and what the facilities are, it could go to a landfill, incinerator, or compost. Mm -hmm. And landfills are very major sources of PFAS contamination. It's been a couple months, and I've now got the results for the items that I sent out to be tested for PFAS. I was worried that there might be Scotchgard on the pre-owned mid-century couch that Ling Ling and I spend a lot of time on. No sign of PFAS there, but it's in other things, things that many might not think of. They found in my dental floss. There isn't a lot of research out there on whether that's a, a big route of exposure. The brand that I use was Oral-B Glide. There are a hundred other brands of dental floss out there that, that don't have PFAS in them. They don't have to put it in there. Turned out my tap water is clean, but then the blood work came in. Both are uh, not good. They found four compounds in my blood and three compounds in Ling Ling's blood at levels that are higher than U.S. medians for most of the chemicals. One of the, the compounds in Ling Ling's blood is about 13 times the median for a U.S. adult. She's a nine pound cat. It's, it's, a, little bit, it's a little bit scary. Did you get a chance to look at the test results? I sure did. They're very interesting. The levels that uh, the lab found in your body were similar to what's seen across the country mm -hmm. in men. So it doesn't look like you have any especially high exposures from, say, your drinking water. Mm -hmm. But it does show that you have these levels of chemicals like PFOS that have been associated with a number of different health concerns. You know, they range from cancer to effects on the immune system. One way PFOS enters our systems is simple. As household items slowly turn to dust, the PFAS drifts along with it. I mean, if I had to just hazard a guess, I'd probably say it's going to be a combination of the diet and the dust. Yeah. Both of you. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're eating fish, you're getting some of these chemicals in your food. We also find that they they build up in our house dust. And mm. so all people are, are exposed to house dust. Mm. If you're a toddler or a cat, then you spend a lot more time kind of interacting with house dust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cats, of course, also have the behavior that they're licking their fur. Right. Another thing I learned with PFAS, blood tests don't tell you everything. What we find with some of these compounds is that they're actually building up in different parts of our bodies. 
like there's one that's been found at higher levels in the in the lungs. But Are you saying that, that that might not necessarily then be detected in in a blood test if it's like right. building up in a different part of the body? Exactly. Yeah. Oh wow, that's another frightening layer to add to this. <laughs> well, that's me. What about my cat? I mean, what about Ling Ling? Like she's up in the 99th percentile. Yeah. So the the half lives are long for some of these chemicals, but if you eliminate the exposures, those concentrations will go down, right? They're not going to go down very fast. They do go down. I found some studies on cats. Cats have been studied for PFAS. Mm -hmm. And so I just had the um, the total PFAS levels from one study that was done in California. They did um, two time frames. One was 2008 to 2010, and then one was 2012 to 2013. Mm -hmm. the total PFAS they had in the earlier time frame was 15.8. So, and then the in the latter time frame it was 8.1. That was the mean level. So she is above average for cats. Uh huh. Wow. California cats. Yeah, California cats. Michigan cats may have more PFAS. Industry has been replacing the PFAS in their products with newer versions of the chemicals that they claim are safer, though Ng and others' research are finding that they aren't. Now there are so many different kinds of PFAS and blood testing can only find some of them, so it likely have much higher levels than the testing revealed. Got all this good information, but man, it just raise more questions than it answered. And some of these yeah, questions yeah. are impossible to answer. And that's just like, what's so frustrating about it? For the most part now, we look outside, the, you know, the sky looks more or less blue. We turn on our water and, and the, the water tastes fine. But we know that that's not always the case. And many of the things we're starting to learn now about chemical impacts on humans are about these low concentration chronic impacts that are not going to make you fall over dead. They're not going to make you pass out, you know, if you, if you breathe the air. But we know that there's a cost over a long period of time. So if we look at the burden of disease in the population, chronic disease is going up. It's something that really stresses our medical system. And it's something that is definitely affected by our increased exposure to environmental chemicals. Should I be worried? I guess let me just ask you that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an anxious kind of person. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you it should keep you up at night. I mean, you had levels that are very typical for Americans. Unfortunately, we do see that, you know, typical levels can be can be tied to certain health issues like, you know, reduced immunity. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a concern. What you can do about that is, you know, take actions to reduce the use of PFAS in your home mm -hmm. and support policies that... Stop. Stop using products we don't keep getting in in our homes. And for more reporting on PFAS, the Great Lakes, and water issues, you can just head to greatlakesnow.org. All right, turning now to the Mary Grove Conservancy in Detroit. In addition to learning and performing arts, it's also home to Pharmacy Food. It's an organization that Chef Phil Jones founded to make healthy food more affordable and accessible to underserved communities. Will Glover talked with Chef Phil after he was honored as the Detroit Free Press and Metro Detroit Chevy Dealers Chef of the Year. They talk about how Chef Phil teamed up with other local chefs to form Too Many Chefs in the Kitchen for Good, which has been cooking and distributing thousands of meals to Detroiters in need during the pandemic. Congratulations, Chef of the Year, um, honored by the Free Press and the Metro Detroit Chevy Dealers. It's a popular top 10 list that they release and you were the top this year. How, how does that make you feel? Um, I, I'm appreciative and I, I, uh, I'm honored for any awards or recognition, but I feel sometimes that gets translated differently to our young folks coming up and it's really not extremely important to me. My personal mission is the most important thing. I'm glad people see and understand and appreciate what I'm doing, but my work is my work and I would do it um, come hell or high water. One of the things that you're known for is uh, pharmacy food. So just tell us a little bit about that and you know how you got started, what pharmacy food is all about. Our mission is to bring healthy people to the food or vice versa. And so we're very much in tune with understanding that food is health, food is medicine, and that our way forward is through how we and what we take in, how what we consume. And we believe that our food system has failed folks. Pharmacy food originated as a healthy meal service in terms of 
a subscription or a meal packs. And so we have a full line of prepared meals that you're able to order online, either have delivered or come pick up here at the Mary Grove Conservancy, take them home, open them when you're ready to eat them, eat them up. They're fresh, they're hot, they're really well-defined in terms of their health benefits. We reach back to our ancestors and our forefathers who their knowledge base and understand that good, healthy foods have always been around us. We just took and did the wrong things with them. And also some of the other things that we do is we do education around the community. Uh, you'll find us out at um, Oakland Avenue Urban Farm doing classes. We just did one on phonio crusted um, fried green tomatoes. And so some of the things that we try to do and in terms of the education is to bring back some of the ingredients of our ancestors that were lost or greatly ignored since the diaspora. And phonio was one of those, which is a West African grain. Uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, I believe, too many chefs in the kitchen for good? Oh, yes, yes. Um, well, Too Many Cooks in the Kitchen for Good was started up by our uh, mutual publicist, David Rudolph, brought together several of our chefs in the community, such as Chef Genevieve or Bangkok 96, and Stephanie Bird and some other folks. But David approached me last March and said, you know, we've got these restaurants that are looking to get rid of their food because they've got to shut down. This is when the mandate came around. What can you do? Can you help us out in any form or fashion? What do you have going on? And while we're not a restaurant per se, what we did have and do have is our ability to make connections out in the community. A friend of mine woke me up one morning and said, do you have a way of getting rid of free semi-trailers full of cooked chicken? Another friend, Anthony Del Bain from Del, Pro Del Bain Produce, sends me a text at three o'clock in the morning and it's a room full of food that needed a home. And we're not talking about trash. We're talking about good, viable food. Our Cherry Capital Food sent 9,000 pounds of, of protein just out of the goodwill. And so we put the effort in, we put the work in, but this was a community effort. It was a bunch of chefs and, and restaurant owners, but it's really beyond us. You know, we work with Food Rescue US to get some of this stuff out to people. I work with, um, make food not waste and you know that organization which i'm a part of that played a part of it what was the biggest challenge that you faced in making sure both you know finding people who were in need and getting these massive amounts of, of food out I, you guys have fed thousands upon thousands of people the biggest challenge is how do you deal with the emotions of all this because at the same time we're trying to help the community we are a part of the community. And so we have amongst our group of folks, they've had their own physical challenges, family challenges, emotional, financial challenges. And sometimes you've got to think about the healers. We were going through all of this stuff at the same time, as, you know, as um, we're losing family members and friends, where we, we dealt with the same terror and fear that everyone else did. And so just being able to deal with our emotions because we feed people or it's about hospitality and that's what we do, but it's just under different circumstances. But how has this experience and this process so far changed you? A couple of things. It's reinforced my belief that we need to fix our food system. And so it's made me feel good about my work. I know that now it has not been in vain. Um, it has shown me a subculture of good in our city and in our communities that needs to be celebrated. I, I see so much good out there and I get to see it all the time because there's so much good happening in food these days, but I got to meet so many more people that understand and get the fact that we need change, that understand that we need good food, that understand that our health outcome can be different, that understand that we can do this together. And so, I've been uplifted. I've, I've, I've been elevated emotionally to a point where I, I'm, I'm, I'm just pleased to see and know that we can actually do this. 
And that is going to do it for us this week. For all of the stories we are working on, plus One Detroit Arts and Culture, which airs on Monday nights at 7.30, just head to OneDetroitPBS.org for more. And I also want to tell you about a special town hall that we're having that concentrates on the future of work. Join me on Wednesday, October 27th at 12.30 p.m. on our One Detroit Facebook page for a town hall focusing on growing middle-class jobs in the city of Detroit and the surrounding region. Plus, how to make Michigan competitive. Find out how to register at OneDetroitPBS.org and join me next Wednesday. All right, that's going to do it for me. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by, and viewers like you.